Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for choosing us over the park for now. For the, the British, British summer time will give you time for uh, going after Sue presentation. Thank you, Sue, for being here. It's my pleasure. So we celebrate International Women's Day. And uh, this year, obviously, COVID had a, a big impact. So we want to talk about the impact of COVID on women's career. And uh, Sue is going to talk about the long-term challenges and solutions. She promises she has some solutions as well. Uh, Sue is the founder of Finding Ada, and uh, she inspires and supports women in STEM, which is very important. We uh, support Finding Ada as well. We are part of the mentorship platform. And uh, yeah, back to you, Sue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here and, and, and talk to everyone. Um, right. Thank you all for, uh, for, for being here. I, I know I've faced some stiff competition with uh, the sunny spring day outside. So uh, special thanks for uh, being here instead of out in the park. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the damage that COVID-19, the pandemic has is, and what we can do to reverse some of that damage. Um, I've split the talk into three parts. Um, so firstly, we're going to talk about the impact uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on women and, and women's careers. Um, we'll talk briefly about managing the return to work. And I mean that both in terms of the return to work for women who've lost their jobs uh, and the return to the workplace for women who have managed to hold on to theirs. Um, and then finally, we'll look at what we need to do to ensure that women's careers fully recover to pre-pandemic levels. Um, but before I start, I want to just uh, say something about caring. I'm going to talk at length about women's childcare responsibilities, um, but it's important to remember that it's not just children that women are caring for. They're also caring for elderly relatives and sick family members. Now, the majority of the research has been focused on childcare. Um, I found very little about elder care and caring for the sick, but women are still responsible for those tasks uh, and the pandemic has exacerbated these issues uh, as well as making child's care more challenging. So when I talk about child's care, I'm actually also really talking about elder care as well and, and caring for the sick. Um, so we are gonna uh, talk about the impact on uh, women's careers. Um, and there have been, I'm going to talk first about women, women in academia and then about women in uh, industry. Um, but when we look at the impact of the pandemic on women, women in academia, several studies have found that women are submitting fewer scientific papers to preprint servers, uh, which is where scientists publish uh, their papers before they're peer reviewed. Uh, an analysis of papers about COVID-19 itself um, so those are papers where the work must have been done during the pandemic and not before, shows that only 12% of authors were women, uh, despite women usually authoring around 20% of papers. Uh, women are also starting fewer research projects. Um, and so that's illustrated by a drop in study registrations. Um, and Although there was one international study that found that scientists overall were spending more time on writing grant applications, other studies have shown that women are submitting fewer applications for funding and they're less successful with the applications that they are submitting. Now, I will go into more about childcare, but within academia especially, there are a couple of factors that are probably playing into these issues. Firstly, male academics are more likely to have partners who don't work outside the home. Uh, so that means that they have someone who's doing all of the domestic labor uh, and that actually means that the pandemic has freed them up to do things like grant applications. Female academics are more likely to have partners who are also in academia, which means that they don't have the same kind of uh, support, they don't have someone else doing all the domestic chores. Um, 
Secondly, this seems to be affecting early and mid-career researchers particularly badly. Um, and some of the papers are suggesting that women are more risk averse so they're less likely to pivot and move into new areas of research. So if their existing research is uh, not possible or uh, you know, affected by the pandemic, they're less likely to try and find a new area that they can uh, actually do some work in. Now, when we look at the situation for women in industry, um, it, it isn't really any better. Um, one in three women work in sectors like hospitality that were largely or completely shut down. And women were a third more likely to be affected by shutdowns than men. 133,000 more women were furloughed than men during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, so 52% of workers uh, furloughed between March and August were women. Um, and younger women were more likely to be furloughed than older women. Um, I haven't seen any studies about further furloughs later in the pandemic, but I think we can assume these numbers are only going to get worse as things progress. Uh, and mothers are 47% more likely to have either permanently lost their jobs or to have had to resign due to the pandemic because they cannot balance their caring responsibilities with their work responsibilities. Unsurprisingly, there is an impact on women's pay. So women are losing out financially as well. 75% of furloughed men had their wages topped up beyond the 80% government cap compared to 65% of women. Uh, now, this might be because they're more likely to work in industries that are more resilient and thus more able to afford to top up these wages. Uh, women in general are more likely to lose paid hours, um, but it's even worse for women who are, are parents. So 72% of mothers said that they worked fewer hours because of a lack of childcare. So before the pandemic, mothers did an average of 6.3 hours of work per weekday, and that has now dropped to 4.9 hours. Um, and 30% uh, of pregnant women um, were suspended uh, on incorrect terms. So they were pushed into taking sick leave instead of maternity leave or told to start their maternity leave early. Now, in terms of homeschooling, I think, you know, uh, anyone who uh, uh, knows mothers or is a mother knows just how much hard work this has been. Uh, women normally do the bulk of the domestic labour, uh, but the pandemic has exacerbated that. So women uh, have spent on average five hours per day on homeschooling uh, compared to about two hours per day for men. Um, and they've also spent more time over three hours on developmental activities. So that's things like doing puzzles or reading or playing games uh, with their children, with men spending less than uh, two hours on those activities. Um, so when you add that up, women are spending over eight hours a day on homeschooling and developmental activities uh, and that's more than double the less than four hours per day that men are spending. Now, you know, the situation is 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 difficult. Um, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel with uh, you know, 30 million people in the UK have now had at least one dose of vaccine. Uh, that's about 55 percent of the adult population. Um, I know that there's a, a slowdown in the vaccine uh, uh, production, but hopefully that will pick up again. Um, and we also know that having one dose of vaccine is at least 80% uh, efficacy. So that means that it was a study came out recently that showed that um, if you'd had one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, the chances of catching COVID were 0.04%. So, you know, things are going to improve. And we need to start thinking about what our return to normal is. 
Um, we need to think about how long this return to normal is going to take. It's not going to be overnight. It is going to be a long haul. Um, and we need to think about two things here. A uh, return to work for women who've been laid off or had to resign from their jobs. And then how we manage a return to the workplace. Um, work by McKinsey and Oxford Economics has predicted that employment for women in the US may not return to pre-pandemic uh, levels for women until 2024 compared to 2022 for men. Um, again, in the US, uh, a quarter of women are considering either leaving the workforce permanently or downsizing their careers, uh, mainly due to increased caring responsibilities. Um, and when we look at past recessions, uh, women re-enter the workforce more slowly than men. Um, so their periods of unemploy unemployment uh, last longer. And COVID, it's not a normal recession that we're experiencing at the moment. So even though once things are back to normal and, you know, people are able to you know, go out and eat out and, and, and go to events, um, you know, and go shopping, then, you know, there is the idea there may be this pent up demand and the economy may bounce back faster than a normal recession. Um, the issues that women face are going to be uh, just as serious for some considerable time because these the impact of the pandemic is going to be longer lasting um, due to issues around childcare. So there is a childcare crisis in the UK at the moment. There has been a loss of childcare provision even before the pandemic started. Uh, but the situation is getting worse because of the pandemic. Uh, childcare is too expensive. Um, and since Mar last March, 33% of mothers have had to give up childcare places due to increased cost and obviously also due to uh, decreased income. Uh, at the moment, about 10,000 child care providers are at risk of closing. And that means about 150,000 child care places may vanish. Um, so the the pressure on ex the remaining child care provision is going to be even greater. And of course, this means that child care workers who are predominantly women are also more at risk of losing their jobs. So we have a significant crisis here that is going to have an impact beyond simply the, the child care providers, because it means that parents are going to find it even harder to locate affordable child care. And that then is likely to result in more women dropping out of the workforce. So it isn't enough for the pandemic just to end, you know, for everyone to get vaccinated. Um, we need to look at the, the long-term impacts um, that the pandemic has had on women's ability to engage with uh, just normal working life. So when we're talking about returning to the workplace, even when women have retained a job, uh, they won't necessarily be able to easily return to work in person. Um, in part because of caring responsibilities. And like I say, because this is going to be a, a gradual return. Um, it, it, it's not, we're not going to completely sort of reopen on one day. Um, and even if that happens as a matter of policy, uh, that may not happen as a matter of practicality. Um, because, you know, some uh, some women are going to need to shield to protect family members who, for example, can't be vaccinated. And if the virus is still circulating, then the need to shield won't necessarily go away. Um, and I think as well, because the pandemic, you know, we've already seen these repeated lockdowns, repeated waves. Um, and we can perhaps uh, hope that that won't continue, but we should prepare for the fact that it might. So as society dips in and out of lockdown or if schools periodically close because there's a, a, an outbreak in a school, um, women just won't be able to 
return to a normal working workday pattern. Um, you know, because of their uh, caring uh, workload um, and because of interruptions. So one survey from last year found that 70% of women reported that they barely managed to find one hour of uninterrupted work. Um, and that was 24 percentage points more than men. So, you know, somewhere around 50% of men struggled to do an hour uninterrupted. And there are also um, certainly anecdotal reports of women uh, who have had to, to reshuffle their days. So they're working late into the evening and even some women uh, working overnight in order to find the peace and quiet to focus. And I think that's just not sustainable. Those kinds of sacrifices, um, we shouldn't be asking women to do that. We shouldn't actually really be um, accepting that women are doing that because you know, working late evenings and, and overnight doesn't make your daytime caring responsibilities vanish. So that's uh, quite a sort of whistle top stop tour of what is really quite a grim picture you know the impact on on women has been significant the research is certainly um uh you know ongoing and we are sort of going to see how this changes over time but what is clear is that if women are to recover to a pre-pandemic level of employment and in, and engagement in the workforce, then they are going to need a significant amount of help and insistent, assistance from employers. Um, we, we know already that women are powering the economy. Companies with more women in senior leadership roles are much more profitable, uh, by up to 15% more profitable. Uh, we know that diverse teams produce better work, um, but what we need is for w uh, businesses to recognise this, recognise how important women are, recognise that if they lose women from their workforce, that's not just a, a problem of equality, that's also an ec economic problem, and it's a problem of, of quality, the quality of work done by diverse teams is just that much higher. So businesses need to, to grasp the nettle and really accept um, that they are going to need to put more money and effort into supporting women's economic recovery. Now, I want to just diverge here just for a second and talk about long COVID. Because when we're thinking about recovery, we need to think about not just the, the issues that face women, but the issues that face other groups of people as well. And the measures that we put in place to support women will also support other groups. And of those groups, an important one is people who suffer from long COVID, the COVID long haulers. So these are people who continue to suffer COVID symptoms long after the initial infection has cleared. So 90% of long haulers actually only had mild symptoms when they first had COVID. And for those long haulers that suffered from mild COVID, 35 to 50% of them still have symptoms two to four months after initial infections. And nearly a third still have symptoms after six months. Um, I know also just again, anecdotally, I know several people who still have cis symptoms after a year, in fact, over a year now since they first uh, contracted COVID in, in March last year. And these figures are much higher for the 10% who were hospitalized. What's also interesting and, and problematic is that mid-career women aged between 40 and 60 are at the highest risk of developing long COVID. Unfortunately, that coincides with what we call the mid-career marathon. Uh, and this is that mid-career uh, point, uh, 10 to 20 years into your career, where women are at the greatest risk of exiting their STEM career. So it's really important that we support women with long COVID um, because they're really getting a double whammy. They've got their mid-career marathon and they've got all of these symptoms that are, are continuing 
um, and they have uh, a lot that they need help with. So I'm going to look now at, at sort of some uh, ways that we can think about policy and make policy changes um, so that we can undo some of the damage that COVID has done and prevent further damage from happening. Um, so one of the key policies really is working from home. Uh, before the pandemic, around five to six percent of the UK workforce worked from home. Um, and as someone who, who worked a lot on trying to encourage uh, more working from home and, and using social media tools to facilitate that, working from home was viewed with really quite deep suspicion by a lot of managers. Um, and so even though broadband speeds now make working from home really easy and, and you know, we're all doing video calls and um, you know, it's much, much more feasible, without trust, working from home can't happen. And the pandemic has changed that in that you know, companies have been forced to enable working from home and, and support it. And I, I hope that the pandemic has driven to a lot of managers and C-suite execs that not only is working from home possible, that it's actually beneficial, you know, when when they are able to get a clear hour, actually people can be very effective working from home. So companies should continue to en enable and encourage that in all of their staff. Um, and whether that's working from home full time or whether it's working to a hybrid model that includes some days in the office, that's not just going to be beneficial to women and COVID long haulers. Um, it's also going to be the responsible thing to do is the pandemic fades. Because um, like I say, it's not going to vanish overnight. So we, we're we not going to see an overnight return to daily commutes. So reducing the number of people, particularly at the beginning of the return to the workplace, reducing the number of people in offices is the responsible uh, thing to do from a, a health standpoint. Flexible working is another thing. You know, allowing people to adjust their hours according to their availability ensures that people can tackle their workload when they're most able to when they're least distracted by children that said we do need to make sure that women are not finding that they are working at 11 p.m or through the night so flexible working needs to be supported um and so you know if people need to that they can um you know uh, adjust their workload and adjust their days and and that will require fractional working so part-time working and job sharing um, and again even before the pandemic we know that allowing fractional working and job sharing helps women to stay in the workforce uh, when they have caring responsibilities and return to the workforce after they've taken career breaks um, to have children or to look after an elderly relative. So we have plenty of evidence from, from the before times that this works. Um, so companies need to review uh, and maybe overhaul their policies to make sure that as many staff as possible can work from home, can work flexibly and can work fractionally. And this all, again, these policies actually are great as a recruitment tool because we know women value them. So if companies are looking at trying to recruit more women in future, then these policies will make them more attractive. We also need to think about pay and bonus policies. Uh, pay increases and annual bonus policies simply cannot be tied to performance. Uh, women's performance has inevitably suffered during the pandemic because of their caring responsibilities and because of this issue around interruption. So if you're tying pay increases to performance, that will punish women further for circumstances that are entirely outside of their control. Now, I know that this idea of uh, pay being tied to performance is, is, is really embedded quite deeply in a lot of corporate cultures. But we are going to have to reassess that, at least in the short term, um, because Otherwise, you are going to see women exiting the workforce in greater numbers 
one year, two years, three years down the line, as they see how uh, their their pay history has been damaged by by the pandemic. And once you have uh, uh, once you're receiving below market rate or lower pay than your peers, it's very, very hard for women to push that number back up again. So, you know, rethinking how pay rises are considered is essential. Now, a lot of low paid staff are also in positions that have higher COVID risk. Um, in industries like technology, that may not necessarily be the case uh, for, for programmers and um, you know, early career people. But when you're thinking about support staff, you know, you're thinking about office staff and, and cleaners and you know, other essential staff, they are the ones who are being put at higher risk of COVID, um, as soon as offices reopen, they need to start commuting while, say, programmers uh, work from home. So considering larger pay rises, a differential pay rise that compensates those staff for the risks that they, they have taken and they will continue to take, I think is, is important. Um, and again, we already know that there's huge pay inequality, and this is an opportunity to tackle that and really think about how we value the people who make higher paid jobs even possible. Now, some businesses in the UK have also offered additional holiday to high risk staff. Um, and that is, I mean, that's not just a, a good thing to do for, for people who have literally put their, their lives more at risk, um, but it also will help reduce that risk by making sure that people feel able to, to take time uh, away from um, high risk situations. Again, this is also helpful for long haulers um, and allow them to help uh, manage their condition and, and return to a normal working schedule. Um, financially, we need to uh, think about those long haulers. Um, so how do we support people who are, are still ill or who fall ill or people who need to self-isolate because of a COVID outbreak locally? So financial support for those people is important. Um, and again, I'm reading about a lot of uh, UK companies who are starting long term hardship funds. Um, so, for example, you know, people who have really struggled with the 80 percent uh, furlough pay cut, um, you know, people who are, are struggling to make ends meet or who incur additional childcare costs or costs because of illness. You know, providing for them, again, is a good way to ret retain uh, people in your workforce. Um, and on the point of childcare going forward, it's really clear that with the childcare crisis in the UK, companies need to just fund more childcare. Um, it is essential if we are going to keep women in the workforce. Uh, really, it, it, it's something that companies can step up and help with because the the childcare market is in in such huge crisis. So, looking forward, once we've dealt with the um, immediate challenges of return to work and, and some of the financial problems that that women in particular are facing, we also need to think about recruitment and promotion going forward. And companies really need to remember that many women are going to end up with a long gap in their CV. You know, it, it's like 18 months. Gonna, well, at the moment, a year, it may be 18 months, it may be two years for some women. They're going to show less progress. They're going to have fewer achievements. They're going to have fewer, uh, you know, what they call esteem indicators, awards and, and such like um, than you would otherwise have expected. And so I would say for the next decade at least, we need to expect and forgive these gaps. And that needs to be written into policy. It can't just be left to individual recruiters to decide to be uh, sort of thoughtful and forgiving. And that should be policy because it is going to take a long time for women to make up the ground that they've lost. Um, when recruiting, when assessing someone for promotion, it's important to ask them how COVID has affected them to understand their experience, because if you don't understand how people have been affected by COVID, then you can't take that into account in your recruiting and promotion processes. Um, and so it becomes important then to focus your recruitment and promotion criteria less on past performance 
and more about future potential. Now, women are notoriously poor at expressing their future potential in their CVs and uh, you know, uh, in their performance reviews. So again, it should be a uh, policy for managers and recruiters to really dig for information about what women are capable of, because they, they may not tell you yourself, themselves. Um, it is very challenging for women because there is a, a sort of modesty glass ceiling. You know, we are taught not to uh, toot our own horn, um, even when we need to. So, again, this is something to think about that should become around a policy change rather than leaving it to individuals to decide how to do that. Uh, continuing professional development is always important. Uh, and it is at times like this at economic stress points that companies consider cutting support for these sorts of programs. But now is when women need those programs more than ever. So that means putting more money into training and development and making sure that women have time during the workday to take advantages of these opportunities. Again, we need to be careful that we're not punishing women for the results of a pandemic that was entirely outside of their control. So we mustn't force women to work longer hours to make up for the damage done by the pandemic. Uh, now, mentoring is essential. And I am a little bit biased because I do run a mentoring platform, but I have seen firsthand the impact that it can have. So it's really important to provide women with support through the tail end of the pandemic and through the next five to 10 years as women are fighting to regain lost territory. Mentoring really should be a foundational part of how companies uh, support and, and progress women um, after this pandemic. And also creating a flexible fund that women can use so that they can access things like conferences, events, uh, professional memberships uh, and other opportunities that will help them to uh, to sort of speed up their professional development and plug some of the gaps in their CV that have been caused by COVID. And finally, we really need to think long term here. Like I've said, um, COVID isn't going away anytime soon. So we need to think about which policy changes can and should be made permanent. And we need to remember that actually many of these policy changes will benefit everybody, not just women. You know, men should be able to work flexibly and work part time and job share uh, just as much as women should. Um, and again, this is beneficial for COVID long haulers, it's beneficial for people with disabilities. Um, so really thinking in the round about these policy changes, you know, the pandemic gives us an opportunity to create positive change and we, we need to, to do that. Um, we also need to think about what happens if long COVID is really long? What happens if it goes on for years? What happens if the, the vast number of people whose performance is impaired by the after effects of COVID don't get better after a year or two years. We need a way to, uh, to support those people and, and make sure that they can stay in the workforce and that they can fulfill their potential. Equally, we need to consider what happens if a variant springs up that can evade the immunity provided by current vaccines. Um, the amazing thing about mRNA vaccines is that they can be quickly adapted, but we have to consider that this pandemic is going to continue for years. There are countries around the world that are really uh, struggling to deal with the pandemic. And the more people that become infected, the more opportunity there is for the virus to mutate. So we have to think about what will happen if we go back into a cycle of, of lockdown and revaccination. And that means companies need to have a pandemic preparedness plan. We don't know what the future holds. We do know what a pandemic looks like in the modern world now. We have all experienced a year's worth of pandemic, which means that we have uh, the opportunity to learn from that year and make preparations for the next one. Um, and as ever, the key thing is we prepare for the worst, but we hope for the best. 
you know, we hope that the uh, vaccination will bring this pandemic uh, to a close within the next 12 months or so. That's certainly what I'm hoping for. Um, but, you know, let's all be uh, uh, be scouts and guides and be prepared. So thank you very much. I, I hope that there's uh, enough useful and, 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 and hopeful content there. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Um, and I do just want to say thank you to all the Finding Ada sponsors for this year, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to do any of this. So I shall uh, stop sharing and return to Q&A. Maybe I should unmute myself. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Uh, yeah, very insightful. And thank you for giving some optimism at the end as well, as along with uh, very useful suggestions. Uh, I was looking at the questions. I have copied some of them from another platform which I have collected before, so they are not all from uh, myself. But let's go in order. Can you see the questions, Sue, as well? Um, um, on the top right. Q &A. Can I? Yeah, I can. So Colin is asking, are there any roles in which men can be particularly helpful when it comes to advocating for gender, gender parity in the workplace? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the key thing that men can do is ask searching questions, um, which is yeah, around some of these policies that I've discussed is, is go to management and say, right, what are we going to do? How is this going to work? Um, and particularly, I think, around pay, um, so we we know that there's not always pay parity. So being open with uh, female colleagues and making sure that they understand what uh, market rate is when it comes to um, you know, applying for promotions and, and so on. And trying to in, if you're a manager, trying to encourage uh, women to apply for promotions and, and actually championing women for uh, progression and for opportunities that you see coming up. You know, if you see an opportunity, you know, is there a woman that would benefit from that? Um, because I think it, it's been hard enough for women as it is. And the, the pandemic has really set things back years, you know, maybe even a decade or more. So we need to be very proactive and we need to consider things like quotas. We need to consider things like um refusing to take an opportunity as a man and handing it over to an equally well qualified woman um and and making that sacrifice because you know ultimately your your uh your career and your business will benefit from having more women around you know we know that that women in senior leadership roles you know results in um uh, uh you know, more profit, more stability, happier companies, uh, better productivity. So you benefit from making that small sacrifice as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Colin, Colin is asking, as people return to the office, how can we ensure that people working from home aren't missing out on decision making and advancement in the workplace? And this is a really, really important question. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you asked, asked it, Colin. Um, this has been a problem for years around remote working, the, the feeling that people who are rem working remotely are, are missing out on important conversations and important meetings, and, and particularly the informal conversations that people have walking down the corridor or you know getting coffee or over lunch. And I think what's important is that we need to recognize where these conversations are happening and when they're happening and make sure that we invite remote workers in. So if you are kind of over a coffee and you're having a conversation with a colleague and saying, yeah, hey, you know, we could do this project like this. Think about, OK, who isn't here? And let's actually have this conversation, not over coffee, but on a Zoom call instead, so that you're making a conscious effort to include people who are working from home. Um, equally, I think having sort of social get togethers, and I know that's like, we're all bored of that by now. We're, we've all had enough of, of Zoom, but 
having informal conversations and I'm not talking about you know pub quiz night on zoom or whatever I'm, I'm talking about things like um if you're going out to lunch with a colleague can you zoom someone in to the table you know if, if you're having a, a a coffee break in the afternoon can you say right 15 minutes we'll actually have our coffee break in a, an empty conference room and we'll bring other people in for coffee you know there's all sorts of of ways that we can involve people from home um so it doesn't have to be a negative thing if some people are working from home and some people are in in the workplace it just means we need to think about how we're having our conversations where and when and and how we can bring others into that um and equally making sure that people working from home feel empowered to uh, ask for additional support, that they feel empowered to say, look, you know, um, I, I can't come into the office and I am feeling like I'm struggling. So I, I need to have, uh, you know, some conversations with people and some support. Or, you know, if people feel like uh, something is happening without them, that they feel empowered to to say, OK, I, I've, these are, you know, meetings are happening without me and I, I need to be involved in this. So it's not just about, you know, largesse and, and inviting people in. It's it's making sure that that everyone feels able to say, you know, when when they're seeing things happening and, and they need to be involved, that it's OK for them to say, look, you know, can you invite me into this meeting? Yeah, absolutely. And this will count also for these sort of events, which, you know, remember last year, so we ran this in person. I don't remember we streamed that. We were even not thinking about that, I believe. Now, from, from now on, events will always be streamed to be more inclusive. Um, next question from me. So immediate action is needed to undo the damage from COVID-19 to women's economic empowerment. What are few examples of immediate actions? You have touched already a few points. Do you have anything else to add? So I would say the, the primary thing that I would do and that I would start now is actually asking the women uh, in your company what the impact of COVID has been on them and actually looking at, you know, what is their priority. So, you know, there are lots of general policy things that can be done, can be done fairly rapidly, but actually understanding where the stress points are for women uh, will help you make better decisions on how you prioritize. So, you know, if you have a lot of women with children, then working out some kind of childcare arrangement, whether that is, uh, you know, a, a childcare payment to allow them to access the now more expensive childcare places, or, you know, whether it's thinking about, you know, can, is there a way to block book at a childcare facility near the office? Or is there a crash? You know, there's that Equally, if you have a lot of women without children, then offering them extra childcare isn't much help. Uh, maybe instead, you know, they're concerned about uh, feeling isolated and they need some form of um, uh, way to connect with their peers and, and with their manager. So the first thing I would do is actually ask and, and, and do it in a sort of, you know, ethnographic way, have conversations rather than sending out surveys. Um, nobody wants to fill in a survey right now. Um, and, and I say that as someone who sent out several surveys recently. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's better to have a chat with someone and to dig a little bit because women may not feel comfortable sort of making themselves vulnerable to a manager. So, you know, find someone kind of neutral who can have these conversations and, 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 and pull out the threads as to, OK, what what will help right now? Interesting. Yeah, very useful. Um, another question from Colin. How might a shift of four day, let me extend the event. Yeah. Um, of four day work week affect women in the workplace? So I'm a, I'm a big fan of four day work week. Um, we have quite a bit of evidence that um, 
people working a four day work week are more productive, uh, they're happier, they, they get more done in less time. Um, and it, it does seem to really help with um, with creativity and with uh, uh, you know, how people approach their jobs. They, they know they've got four days to, to get stuff done and get stuff done they do. Um, the flip side of this is that we also know that the longer hours someone works, the less productive they are and the less um, capable they are. They produce worse work, not just less work. So there is kind of pre-pandemic plenty of evidence that supports the idea of a four day work week. Um, and I think if everyone, not just women, worked a four day work week, I think the benefits would be huge, be particularly if there's flexibility in when those four days are. Um, so what you then have is um, more downtime for women to, to recuperate from kind of juggling childcare and work. Um, you also have you know, if women with partners, if their partner's on a different, uh, has a different day off, then that means you've only got three days in the week where your know, childcare is a challenge. So that then reduces the financial burden for paying for childcare. So there's all sorts of benefits of shifting to uh, a four day week. I think, you know, so I'm self-employed, I could easily put myself on a four day week. I think the problem that we have, that I have is psychological that it feels very much like a three day weekend is is a luxury that we can't afford. Um, but the evidence doesn't say that. So I think certainly um, pilot and again, the pandemic gives us an opportunity to really change things up. So piloting a four day week uh, would, might be a great way now might be a great time to think about trying that and seeing if it has a positive impact. Um, I think for many people and for many companies, we won't believe it until we actually see it and do it. So, you know, maybe now's the time for that. Oh, I can't hear you, Benna. You seem to have. Uh... Oh, you're right. back. No, I can't hear you at the moment. You're muted. Well, maybe. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, AirPods, don't don't buy it. Don't, really don't. Um, <laughs> well, uh, let's move. Question, which I'm very interested as well. Um, have you done any comparative research with other countries in Europe and how they have approached to tackle the employment policies? And can the UK learn something from others? Of course, we're talking oh, about Europe. Yeah, yeah. I, I have not specifically dug into what's happening in, in other countries. Um, I am fairly sure that, yes, there's always something to learn from other countries. Um, I, I do know that actually on the four day week, um, I saw a report that I believe it was in Spain that they were looking at a, a four day week. Um, I think it's always worth looking at policies in uh, Northern Europe, in uh, Scandinavia. They have really good um, attitudes towards things like maternity and paternity leave. And we know, for example, that um, increasing the amount of paternity leave actually means more women return to the workplace, uh, which is a little counterintuitive, but it's important for, for fathers to engage <clears throat> with uh, the caring responsibilities very early in their child's life. And it's beneficial for fathers as well. It allows them to bond with their children and go through the same learning curve that women go through when they're first learning how to, to care for this new life uh, that they have created. So I would say definitely, yes, there is a lot to learn from uh, other European countries. Perfect. Um, one question from Claire. So performance-based pay is embedded in many workplace practices. Do you have any examples of where potential-based pay has been used as an alternative? I don't have at the moment any specific examples of that but i'll tell you where that re that recommendation came from um 
what we know from uh, psychology, so particularly around the, the psychology of persuasion, is that um, when people are looking at things like pay rises and promotion, whether they realize it or not, they are actually already considering potential as um, a key factor in how much money they uh, will award someone. So there was a, a study done where um, there was uh, two sports uh, personalities were used as examples, one very established uh, and one new. And people were asked how much they thought that these sports personalities ought to um, get in the next season. And unfailingly, people wanted to pay the, the new but slightly lower performing uh, athlete more than the more established and very well performing athlete, which is is somewhat bizarre because you would think, right, the, the well performing athlete should get more. But actually what people are responding to is the potential that the younger, uh, newer athlete had. So whether we realize it or not, we're actually already doing potential based uh, pay rises and promotions. Um, we just haven't actually untangled that from performance reviews and we haven't recognized that formally. So the reason that I say that when you, we need to go uh, move away from performance based uh, pay rises is because actually performance based pay rises are and can be very misleading anyway. Um, and I want to draw another parallel to certain recruitment practices, particularly in tech, where um, people, are, uh, recruiters are asking to see evidence of uh, contributions to open source software projects. And that immediately disadvantages women because it's harder for women to get their commits accepted. It's harder for women to be openly female in open source software development. Um, it's harder for women to find the time because they have more domestic and caring responsibilities. So when you have recruiters who are looking for um, access to uh, open source contributions, then actually you're already looking at that as a, a potential indicator you're looking at engagement in open source software as well you know this is what they're capable of rather than actually just looking at the the woman's abilities and saying this is what she's capable of so in, in many ways i think we're we're wrongly attached to performance-based pay and, and to thinking that that's what we're doing because we're not we're already doing a lot of potential base pay and i think the um the the pandemic has simply made it necessary for us to accept that and interrogate the criteria we use for pay increases and promotions. Fantastic. <clears throat> Very useful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is from Luisa. Do you think the pandemic will end up being an opportunity to progress or regress for gender rights in the workplace? I've seen a lot of people saying, you know, gender rights have been pushed back 10 years, 20 years. Um, I think it's going to be what we make it. I think what hasn't changed and what the pandemic cannot change is our understanding of gender equality. Um, it cannot change the number of activists and advocates for gender equality. Um, I think I hope that a lot more men now will recognize just how much work goes into childcare and domestic chores and that more men will step up to the plate. I hope that more men will recognize the challenges women are facing in the workplace and will be the squeaky wheel that, that forces change because you know, men still do have a lot of power. A man asking for change is, is much more likely to get it than a woman asking for change. So I am hoping that even if we go back a little bit immediately, that we will actually see a bit of an explosion in uh, advocacy for gender equality. And, and I, I really encourage uh, any men watching to, to get involved and to, to be the noisy person that is demanding change and take that weight off women's shoulders. 
um, because firstly, you'll be much better at it because you have the power. Um, and, and secondly, it would just be so lovely for someone else to do a little bit of that labor. Um, it would be very much appreciated. It would be wonderful. Um, be an ally. That, that we talk a lot about being an ally and yeah, very important concept. Um, still from Visa, do you think orgs like Pregnant then Screwed are unique to the pandemic or addressing long-term inequity in our society? So I, I love Pregnant Then Screwed. Um, if you aren't aware of them, you should go and, and, and look them up, look at some of the reporting they've done around the impact uh, uh, on the pandemic, on, on pregnant and uh, uh, pregnant women and mothers. Um, I believe they've been around for longer than the pandemic, but I don't think they're going anywhere. I think organize, organizations like that that are working specifically around um, some of these very gendered issues, uh, it's great to see them uh, uh, appear in, in the, the, the advocacy landscape, but they are not going to go anywhere because we're going to still need them because even if we come out of this with the best possible result with, you know, a rethinking of, of all of these policies and practices, you know, there are still going to be areas where we can improve. So um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they're here and um, I, I look forward to seeing what they achieve over coming years because, uh, yeah, we need them. Amazing. And for the last question, so Luisa has volunteered to come on stage and explain it. Uh, should we try to read it first? Do you think issues like Slack's abusive message loader earlier this week are harbing an example of how reduced diversity in teams affect products? Do we need Lisa? I would need I would need Lisa. Do you need Lisa? I I, I know exactly what Lisa is uh, talking about. Cool, here. cool, cool. Um, we don't need so Lisa. For for anyone who missed this, uh, Slack announced that there were going to be cross Slack workplace direct messages. Um, so if you were in a paid team, you would be able to find and direct message a member of another Slack group, regardless of whether they were paid or not. And a lot of people pointed out that this is absolutely brilliant for anyone who wants to send abusive messages to women. Um, because as a recipient, you, you uh, when they announced that there was going to be no way to, to block people, I mean, you can't block people you don't know exist. Um, and, and no way to prevent those messages coming in. Uh, Slack did backtrack, um, and I think the pressure that they've, they've had is, uh, has been very significant and is going to make them rethink how the whole that bit of functionality works. Um, this is absolutely not new. We have so many examples of a lack of diversity resulting in uh, poor product decisions. I mean, you can look at uh, Apple when they uh, first launched their health app and there was no way for women to track menstruation. So 51% of the population are women and uh, we were completely ignored. Uh, you see exactly the same in you know, research around seatbelts did not include tests on crash test dummies made to female proportions. Um, you know, you see the same in drug trials and drugs not tested on women. Um, so this kind of a problem, this is a, a, a very, very long standing problem. Um, and it's it's particularly egregious and noticeable, I think, in tech, because tech uh, tends to get uh, developed and released very rapidly. And because there is such low diversity in tech that these problems crop up over and again. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Clippy. Um, if you remember the little animated paperclip in Microsoft that used to pop up and say, I see you're writing a letter. Would you like help with that? And uh, apparently when they first user tested it, all the women basically went, yeah, can you not? This is really creepy. And the development team went, yeah, we're going to anyway. Uh, and now Clippy is one of the most hated uh, aspects of, I think, any any bit of software in the history of software. So I think, yes, it is absolutely essential to, to have more diversity um, so that you know, just we produce good quality work that we you know and it's the same for uh, racial diversity and disability diversity and LGBT diversity if we bring these people to the table they bring uh, expertise that can help create better products and, and services and solutions so yeah I absolutely agree with that. 
Thank you, Luisa. And thank you, Sue. Thank you very, very much. I think it's been super helpful for everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, and yeah, this has been recorded. So I'll share with you, Sue. I'll share with everyone else. And yeah, again, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure to uh, to talk to you all again today.